Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new edition of CEO and Market Expert Interviews. I'm your host, Lucian. Some of you know me as Triangle Investor from X. Today, I am joined by my returning guest that needs no introduction, Mr. Rick Rule. Welcome to my show. It is great to have you once again. Uh, a pleasure to be back with you. I enjoy these discussions. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Uh, Rick, I want to start with a question uh, regarding the bank business you you started a few months ago, or maybe even more. What's going on? Some of your uh, listeners probably know that about two years ago, a group of us began to start another bank. Yeah. Uh, this, this adventure was the outgrowth of a bank that this team started in 2000 called Everbank, one of the first internet-based banks in the United States. That bank was hugely successful, growing from uh, a standing start in 2000 to having 270,000 customers and $28 billion in assets under management by the time it was sold in 2014. The people that we sold that bank to uh, was a large annuity company, and they used the banking platform, as they should, to service their existing customer base. The consequence of that is that the customer base that we established <laughs> was allowed to languish. The unique products and services that we offered were, let's just say, uh, not the emphasis of that bank. Uh, as our customers began to approach us, our former customers began to approach us about the fact that their bank had left them. As entrepreneurs, uh, we couldn't help but get started again. So we founded something called Battle Bank. The concept of Battle Bank is, again, an online bank where our branch is your phone or your computer. Uh, not having a branch network lowers our non-interest expense by almost one and a half percent. Those savings can be passed on to both depositors, borrowers, and, of course, shareholders. We will focus, once again, on unique deposit products. Uh, as an example, with Battle Bank, uh, you'll get paid on all of your savings, including the savings in your checking account. With Battle Bank 2, uh, you'll be able to save in 22 currencies, not just the U.S. dollar. Now, this will take some time, of course, but that's what we got up to, if my memory serves me well, in Everbank. Uh, at Battle Bank, your IRA, if you're an American, uh, will be allowed to do things like own duplexes and triplex, own, owner-operated real estate, mm -hmm. uh, own franchises or small businesses. And in particular, uh, if you have holdings of precious metals domiciled in the United States in segregated accounts, you can borrow against your precious metals holdings. You can borrow against them for any purpose, the down payment on a house, to buy more precious metals, just to access credit for some other form of investment. So we're very excited about this. We have been almost two years in organization. The regulatory processes in the United States uh, and around the world are fairly slow. Yeah. It, in, in fairness, Lucian, uh, the regulators have had a difficult time in the United States dealing with the bankruptcies of certain banks. Uh, unfortunately, as a consequence of things like Silicon Valley Bank, yeah. uh, First Republic Bank, Sovereign Bank, our file wasn't on the top of their desks. But we've used that time to work on the software, work on the bank, work on the lending products around precious metals, and we are eager. We believe that we will be able to commence operations this summer. Uh, any of your global audience, particularly your American and Canadian audience, but your global audience who is dissatisfied with their current bank uh, is encouraged to go online to battlebank.com, where we will truly battle for your business. Good to hear. Okay. Uh, Rick, let's start with the question about the commodity bull cycle. It has been a topic for years now, and I want to hear your opinion on that. Some people argue that we have seen hardly any of that bull cycle. So are we in a bull cycle or one is yet to come? Clearly, we're in a bull cycle, uh, I think. Uh, when people say we're not in a bull cycle, what they're talking about is the last three months. <laughs> if your frame of reference goes back to, say, the year 2000, which is where my frame of reference goes, uh, we are clearly uh, in a bull cycle. Uh, if you look, uh, as an example, at the gold price in U.S. dollar terms, uh, gold is up something like 8.6, 8.7% annually, compounded for 20 years. The people who don't think we're in a bull cycle are people who either aren't very good at arithmetic uh, or, or whose imagination 
uh, is probably particularly acute. But if you look around a range of commodities over the last two decades, pick one, oil, coal, copper, nickel, uh, e even the ones that are down substantially in the last uh, 18 months, like lithium, we are clearly in a bull cycle. And the reasons for that are really simple. There are 8 billion of us on the planet. <laughs> uh, every day, there's more. For 40 years, we've done a great job lifting the poorest of the poor worldwide, 1.5 billion people out of dire poverty, making them merely poor as opposed to extremely poor. Is there a lot more to be done? Absolutely, but we've done a great job. The consequence of that, Lucian, is that when poor people get more money, which has happened on a wonderful scale for 40 years, yeah. the stuff they want to buy is made of stuff. When you and I get more money, we buy some little gadget from Apple or we buy a service. But when poor people get more money, they replace a thatch roof with a metal roof. They, they replace mud wattle uh, with concrete. They go from barefoot to shoes, to bicycles, to 50cc motorcycles, to a Toyota Hilux. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is going on around the world. Uh, is the bull market going to continue? Of course. There's a billion people on earth with no access to primary electricity. A billion. There's another two billion people on earth with access to either intermittent or unaffordable power. And the same can be said for calorie counts. The same can be said for the, the whole range of the material standards of living. Meanwhile, you want to live better too. You want your children to live better than you did. All of this requires stuff. Agreed. Now, yeah. could, we have a global, could we have a global recession that delays this? Absolutely, positively. Again, it's important that investors think about their time horizons, think about what is possible, as opposed to thinking about merely what they want to happen in a market. Yeah, good point. I uh, have to agree with that. Uh, you mentioned gold, and uh, gold, gold is one of the commodity that is now at all-time high. But majority of gold stocks are around five-year low. Can mm -hmm. you explain the disconnect with those two? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and first of all, gold is only in all-time highs in nominal terms. Nominal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah. real terms, against the U.S. dollar at least, gold is not at all-time highs. And people yeah. need to understand that when they think about where gold might go. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is, with regards to the underperformance of the gold price, it's worth noting <clears throat> that buying of gold is not widespread. You are not seeing retail buying of gold except in China and India. The gold purchases that you're seeing are central bank purchases. And those central bank purchases uh, are really looking for an asset that could be a medium of exchange outside the U.S. dollar. It's the weaponization of the dollar rather than the fear of inflation that is the driver of gold itself. These gold buyers, central banks, are not buyers traditionally of gold equities or equities at all, for that matter. So it makes perfect sense, <clears throat> pardon me, at the top of the discussion to say that the gold bull market and the market in gold stocks thus far is disconnected because while the buyer has a need for gold to circumvent the U.S. dollar, the buyer doesn't have a need for gold stocks. Yeah. But there's a second reason that I think uh, is worth discovering, uh, and that is the chronic underperformance of gold mining companies as businesses for the last 50 or 60 years. Lucian, if you were as old as I, which I can tell you're not, <laughs> you would remember the decade of the 1970s when the gold price went from 35 US dollars to $850. The best bull market for gold stocks uh, probably in recorded history. Uh, the hangover from that, if you will, uh, is that the gold stocks that rewarded investors the most in that bull market were the ones that exhibited the most leverage to gold. And the most leveraged companies, ironically, are the most marginal. If you're a high cost producer and the gold price goes up, your margin increases faster, ironically, uh, than a more efficient producer. When the investor, which they have now for the last, I'm going to say, 50, 60 years, looked at gold investments, they looked for the most leverage, which is to say the most marginal. And the industry became very, very marginal. Yeah. If you look back to the decade 2000 to 2010, the gold price in U.S. dollars was up more than sevenfold. And yet free cash flow per share 
among the XAU in the U.S. declined. It took real skill to screw up a market where the selling price of your product increased sevenfold and you reduced free cash flow per share. So the expectations that the investment community has around mm -hmm. gold mining companies are extraordinarily low. From my point of view, that's good news. Uh, it's good news because I don't have much competition on the bid on the bid for gold mining stocks. And I would suggest to you that investor rep, uh, some investor um, expectations have become more rational. Uh, I would suggest that most of the management teams that presided over the destruction of capital in the period 2000 to 2010 have been allowed to pursue other <laughs> employment opportunities. So I think that the gold industry is held in low repute uh, ironically, uh, right uh, at the beginning of its renaissance. Uh, and I regard this as a particular opportunity. Yeah. Can we apply this answer you gave me uh, on silver as well? I mean, silver is also one step up, two steps down. How is the outlook for silver from your corner? Well, the silver stocks are tricky because there aren't very many of them, first of all. Uh, and also because the silver companies are price takers. Most silver that's produced is produced from recycling or as a byproduct of other metals. So to understand something about the silver price five years from now and 10 years from now, you have to understand something about what the production levels of copper, lead, zinc, and gold are, where, where silver is produced as a byproduct. It is very, very, very tricky. It's worth doing uh, because in the later stages of a precious metals bull market, gold moves first. We all know that. Yeah. In the later stages of a gold bull of a precious metals bull market, when silver moves, it moves much faster and much further than gold does. And the silver stock buyers are manic depressive. Uh, they either hate the material with a passion, like right now, or they're absolutely rabid buyers. Uh, Good point. Yeah. Uh, the joke Rick, is that, uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, let's discuss also uranium. Uh, one smart man told me that the easy money has been made and that the real money gets made now. You know the man. Uh, what is next for uranium? I, I think it's true that the easy money was made when silver progressed from being hated at $20 US a pound to tolerated and sometimes loved at 100 US dollars per pound. Uh, the market has begun to settle settle out, which is to say that the spot market has declined from 108, 110 down to something like 90. Uh, every market needs a breather and uranium is getting its breather. It got too hot. What's important to note, Lucian, is that the structure of the uranium market has changed and not one investor in a thousand has paid attention to this. First of all, in terms of the spot market, it's now highly illiquid. It used to be very liquid but it's highly illiquid. The truth is that more dollar volume often takes place in the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust than takes place in the spot market, which is to say the tail is wagging the dog. One could go so far as to say the Sprott market is the spot market, which is an interesting circumstance. The trades are taking place now in the term market. And this is important because it's a, it's a mechanism where producers and consumers can lock in security of volume and price for the five-year term, the 10-year term, the 15-year term. Uh, on the consumer's uh, you, you know, needs, uh, new uranium, uh, new nuclear-powered plants are very capital-intensive. And increasingly, the bank financiers of new plant construction are requiring the plant owners to lock in enough supply of uranium uh, over a reasonable period of time that they can amortize the loan. So there's a huge demand for secure supplies of uranium. Unlike any other commodity that I know of in the world, the market structure in uranium is changing from one where the producer and the, and the consumer are held hostage to overnight markets to one where uh, both uh, supply and price are locked in. From a producer's point of view, this adds great certainty to their revenues and pretty good certainty to their margins, which means that lenders to the uranium space don't have to be concerned with market fluctuations as yeah. much. From the point of view of an old lazy securities analyst like Rick Rule, uh, the idea that you have some pricing cer certainty uh, makes it much easier to value the equities. 
my suspicion is right now, of course, these terms are very opaque and you have to work very hard to come to understand them. My belief is that the companies that are transparent and forthcoming uh, with their term pricing will enjoy lower costs of capital. And I suspect over the next five years that there will be something approaching standard industry reporting around these term contracts. Mm -hmm. If that happens, uh, my suspicion is that uranium will enjoy the lowest cost of capital of any of the specialty commodities. And I look forward to that. Same here, same here. Uh, Rick, I have a list of companies I would like if we can cover them. The list includes silver, gold, copper, and uranium companies. And I would like to hear your opinion on them, if you hold them or plan to add them in the future, or maybe you sold them. Some pros and cons uh, about the companies. Uh, one minute Listen, I, answer I, maximum I, about the, uh, I, about the I, I would like to say that uh, this part of the conversation doesn't stand the test of time. This is a snapshot in time. So my opinion and my holdings uh, are official as of today and could change in a week. Exactly. If circumstances exactly. change. We okay. have a disclaimer. Okay, yep. got it. Okay. Let's start with silver and we will start we'll start with silver crest metals. Silver crest, I don't own. Uh, I like the operating performance of the company. I was shocked by the uh, degrade in um, reserves between the feasibility study and production. They're looking to address that. When I see a new resource statement uh, and I see what the reserve life looks like and I can match that to their operating performance, I look forward to becoming a shareholder again. I do not hold it now pending the outcome of delineation drilling. Okay. Uh, Pan American Silver. Pan American Silver I own and I am adding to. Uh, I was uh, disturbed and sold when they acquired Yamana. What they were saying was that the Yamana assets were worth more yeah. than their own assets, which was disappointing to me. Yeah. But then the price fell by 55%. Meanwhile, the company is selling off the redundant assets in Yamana to strengthen their balance sheet. And of course, there are two uh, wonderful optionality plays within Pan America. One, 500 million high-grade ounces in Guatemala, where they need permission to restart, another 500 million high-grade ounces in Argentina, where hopefully the change in administration allows uh, Pan American finally to beneficiate those ounces for the benefit of the Argentine people and Pan American shareholders. Good point. Uh, Hecla Mining? Uh, I own Hecla. There are some operating challenges there, but Hecla is probably, in terms of investment, the foremost brand name for American investors to participate in the silver trade. Uh, fair to say, I'm also a friend of the CEO, uh, and I like the fact that I can ask him direct questions and get direct answers, even <laughs> if the answers aren't too pleasant for him to convey to me. <laughs> yeah. What about the Vizla Silver, Greg Perry? Uh, I am a decent-sized shareholder of Vizla. Your uh, listeners need to understand there's some unanswered questions around Vizla. This is highly speculative. I love circumstances where there are indicated big deposits, but some unanswered questions, where I think I know how the questions will be answered. So I'm a fairly large shareholder of Visla Silver. I like the size. I like the grade. I don't like the neighborhood. Um, but you take the good with the bad. Yeah, but you have to agree it's a great management. He's a fantastic, fantastic guy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, first Majestic First Majestic Silver, I've owned on and off for a long time. I don't own it now. It's the most leveraged silver name I know. Uh, so it will respond very well to increases in the silver price. My concern revolves around the acquisition of Jarrett Canyon uh, and their need to invest money in Jarrett Canyon, their uh, need to delay gratification for a couple of years at Jarrett Canyon. If they succeed with Jarrett Canyon the way they succeeded with San Dimas and other large tired mines that they bought, this will be a spectacular performer. But remember, I began that sentence with the word if. Uh, I'm holding out until I see something around the answer to if at Jarrett Canyon. Got it. Uh, Mag Silver? I own Mag Silver, very high quality deposit. I don't know where they go from here. It's, <laughs> I don't yeah. know how it gets much better. Um, there is a suspicion in the market that Mag Silver can't be taken over because there's only one bidder, but that's wrong. The high grade nature of that deposit means that it could be bought by either, as an example, Franco Nevada or Wheaton Precious, and then sold on to the Mexican company in return for a stream and a royalty. I don't think that the final chapter of the MAG story has been played yet. Yeah. Uh, Fortuna Silver Mines. 
Fortuna Silver I own, although it's not really a silver company anymore. Yeah, it's, it's more of a gold company. Gold. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they're having both political and operational problems at San Jose, uh, which has been their leading source of cash flow. On the other hand, their Argentine operations are finally working and they're establishing a real producing base in West Africa. The question was always, could a Latin American CEO and a Latin American management team operate in West Africa? And the answer is crystal clear. The answer to that is yes. Uh, we have a, it's a lower on scale, uh, Silver One Resources with assets in Nevada. I don't know enough about Silver One to comment. Okay, Dolly Varden Silver? Uh, Dolly Varden, I'm an owner. Uh, I'm a small owner. I've uh, sold enough that I have my cost out of the stock. It's been a really great market performer. What they have now is two reasonable deposits. And my bet is that those are both part of the same mineralized event. Uh, if they can turn those two deposits into a silver district, particularly if they can do it in Taltan territory, uh, the First Nation that is their host, uh, I think you'll see a spectacular outcome. But notice again that I said if. This is okay. highly speculative. Yeah, I have uh, a very high regard for the CEO. Uh, I, I like the deposits, but they need to get bigger. They need to establish district scale. Mm -hmm. uh, final silver, then we will move, move to gold, uh, Abra Silver Resources. Uh, Abra Silver, they, again, I'm a large shareholder. I, I'm embarrassed to say I, uh, I helped Silver Standard buy that asset years ago as Diablios for $3 million. Uh, we were warehousing it and didn't do much work. <laughs> the new management team has done a bunch of work and turned what was a $3 million investment uh, by us into a $200 million, $250 million net present value. Uh, large deposit, growing better infrastructure in the region. It was in the middle of nowhere 30 years ago, but yeah. the lithium activity in Salta has changed all that. Uh, again, what you really have is an exploration story. What I think is that you have a deposit that's threatening to turn into a camp. Uh, mm -hmm. So I own it, but it's highly speculative. Yeah. Uh, let's move to gold, uh, wheat and precious metals. Uh, wheat and precious metals belongs in every precious metals portfolio, as does Agreed. Franklin Premium price, yes. Premium business, too. Premium asset allocator in the in the form of Randy Smallwood. The general and administrative expense relative to net assets or, or relative to free cash flow is extremely low. Top quality company, top quality human. Yeah. Uh, what about gold mining, Amir Adnani? Uh, I own gold mining, but I've dragged my capital back out of it. Uh, this is an optionality play. So these are assets that even at today's prices are marginal. You have a fantastic team in place looking to beneficiate these assets with third party, other people's money. And Amir is, uh, Amir is, you know, one of this generation's sort of living legends, uh, a young guy, but you, he, he compares favorably at a similar age with the Ross Beatties and the Bob Quartermains and the Clive Johnsons of the world. He's a, just a superb human being. Sandstorm gold. Sandstorm's a turnaround play, uh, and the turnaround was delayed by their joint venture partner, SSR Mining, uh, having that tragic uh, uh, mine collapse in Turkey, which delays, I suspect, uh, construction and production at Had Madden, which will be the catalytic event to take uh, uh, Sandstorm higher. Sandstorm is criticized rightly in the market for poor allocation of capital four or five years ago. My belief is that Nolan Watson learned his lesson, uh, that he isn't going to be so cute. He isn't going to buy Batsock into the tre treasury high and then have to reissue it low. <laughs> uh, this is a company where once Hod Modern gets in production, the cash flow coming through this company is going to resemble a pig going through a python. Uh, <laughs> it's that, you know, I mean, this this might be three years out, four years out. When it occurs, the dimension of this cash is really going to shock people. Probably, yes. I agree. Uh, Newmont? Uh, I don't own Newmont, but I have sold puts. Uh, I don't like Newmont's return on capital employed over 25 years. I don't like their AISC. I don't like the fact that they're serial acquires of second tier properties. The merger with Newcrest has the chance to be transformative in the sense that Newmont Management has now said they're going to sell off all of their tier two properties and focus their love, to, uh, you know, care and attention on tier one properties. The sales process, if it occurs, 
should A, strengthen up their balance sheet materially, but also allow them to focus rather than on 30 mines, on five or six good mines. The consequence of that is that although I have not been a Newmont buyer, I have been a Newmont put seller. Mm -hmm. uh, Equinox Gold Corp. Equinox Gold Corp, uh, I, I think, is a superb opportunity. The stock fell by half yeah. as, a, as a consequence of the Hard Rock deposit, building up the Hard Rock deposit in Northern Ontario. The market's bet, given the industry's track record uh, in Northern Ontario, cost overruns, uh, was very negative. Uh, the company has now substantially completed the mine on time, on budget. We now need to shake the mine out. If in six months or nine months, they deliver nameplate capacity, which is to say, if the mine performs uh, as it was slated to do in the feasibility study, I think at today's gold price, today's gold price, without any increase in gold price, the stock doubles. Remember, again, I began the sentence with the word if. Of, of course, of course. Uh, I am gold. Uh, I am gold. I'm not a holder. Uh, I need to see Cote work. They basically bet the company there. Uh, and Cote Lake is one of the reasons why the in, why the investment community holds the mining industry in such low regard, at least uh, around northern Canadian developments. This is a this is a mine that was a couple of years delayed uh, and came in more than double budget. I have to see Cote Lake work before I can return to IM Gold because the company basically bet its ent entire future on Cote Lake. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alamos Gold. Uh, Alamos, I don't own, but again, I I hold them in high, fairly high regard. I've known John McCloskey, the CEO, I'm embarrassed to say for 40 years, a, a very long time. He and I were young pups, wet behind the ears together. Uh, my criticism uh, of Alamos would seem to be, despite superb performance and, and a wonderful relationship between, frankly, uh, enterprise value and net asset value, that it seems to me to be a collection of high performing tier two assets. I don't see a tier one asset there that I can really get excited about. Okay, but it is on your radar. Absolutely. it's. I mean, they've done a superb job in terms of return on capital employed, uh, in terms of all in sustaining cost, uh, all of the financial metrics that one looks at, they've excelled at. Yeah. Uh, Kinross? Uh, jury's out on Kinross. Uh, they need to make uh, both Mauritania uh, and now Ontario work. I don't own them. Okay. Uh, final gold, uh, B2 gold. B2 gold I love. Uh, there are some challenges there sociologically, uh, I would suggest in Mali. Uh, the investment community doesn't like the fact that the company continues to focus on Gramalote in Colombia. Uh, I personally uh, favor that. Again, I've known Clive Johnson, the CEO there, for 45 years. Uh, he has been serially successful. This team doesn't make bad acquisitions. Of course, we'll see <laughs> yeah. if Goose Lake is a bad acquisition. They are superb mine builders, good mine operators, and they are very, very, very good at uh, operating in emerging markets, both in terms of the, the national politics, uh, but also in terms of the local community. Uh, they have not gotten enough credit for their ability to operate in the Philippines, you know, uh, in the southern part of Africa, in all of the parts of the world that they've offer, uh, operated in, never mind in Mali, where there's an active jihadist insurgency. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's move to copper, uh, starting with Ivanhoe Electric. I own Ivanhoe Electric. Uh, I own it because of really promise. Uh the Typhoon technology that they have licensed with regards to mining yes. has the potential. I'm not saying it is, but it has the potential to be an absolute game changer. Agreed. Uh, of course, the power behind the throne, Robert Friedland, is the most successful mining financier of my generation. I also like the Santa Cruz asset in Arizona. On, though, although it's early on, I like the potential, and I say potential. Uh, for uh, a deep porphyry, uh, a buried porphyry around Tintic. So uh, while I own it, I don't talk to former clients about it very often because it is highly, highly, highly speculative. Yeah. For people who are very close to me, people who have done business with me for 40 years uh, and people who have a speculative bent, of course, uh, I suggest that they get to know Ivanhoe Electric better. Uh, what about Hud Bay Minerals? I don't own Hud Bay. Uh, again, I see it a collection as a collection of mostly 
uh, second tier assets. Uh, and, and while I think the company is OK, there are, from my point of view, better companies in the same market cap space as them. Uh, two Lundin companies. First is Lundin Mining. I own a lot of Lundin Mining. Uh, and they seem to cruise from success to success. Uh, they have made very fortuitous acquisitions. They're generating a lot of free cash. And if I were a betting man, and I am, uh, I would bet that it's Lundin Mining that consolidates the Lundin exploration assets in northern Argentina. Uh, this has the potential to be generationally transformative. Yeah. Uh, what about Philo? Well, Philo is, uh, I've been there. So I, I need to start by saying this is a remote and desolate part of the world. This is yeah. really truly in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so the upfront capital costs to build in that district are going to be spectacular. It's worthy to note that the Lundines can approach this asset either from the north and the east or from the west, from Chile. They're all over the district. Philo is, well, let me rephrase this, the camp, uh, the Vicuña district, including Philo, uh, is a really, really important copper province. Uh, it will probably take between eight and ten billion dollars to build the camp, and I actually think the Lundines have the capability of doing it. Yes, uh, this grade uh, and the fact that we really don't understand after twenty years the size and scope of the deposit reminds me of nothing so much as Erzberg and Grassberg uh, forty years ago when Freeport take, took control of that those assets in Arian Jaya. I'm not trying to suggest that Vicuña is another Grassberg, but I'm not trying to suggest it isn't too. Yeah. Uh, it's a one-on-generation discovery. Definitely. Uh, what about tech resources? I own tech. Uh, I think that the restructuring of tech will surprise people. I'm delighted that tech has decided that they are going to uh, monetize the coal assets internally, which is to say, uh, distribute them out, monetize them partly at the corporate level, and then let us decide what to do with the rest of it. Ironically, the coal business is probably the best business in tech, uh, and they've had to monetize that really for um, ESG considerations. But the remaining company uh, is a pretty darn good company, and I suspect that the value of the whole is greater than the price put on the sum of the parts. <laughs> uh, Tasico of Mines? I don't own them. Uh, again, uh, a, a range of assets that, while it's attractive to Canadians, are not uh, by any stretch of the imagination, tier one assets. Uh, let's try with some on the lower scale. Faraday copper. Don't know enough to comment. Okay. Brixton metals. Uh, I am having a di difficult time myself uh, understanding the drilling well enough to make a deposit out of it. So I don't own it. Okay. Uh, Oroco resources. Again, don't know enough to comment. And the uh, final one, sur Surge Copper. Again, don't know enough to comment. Yeah, those were the lower scale. Let's move yeah. to Uranium. Uh, the first one and the biggest one, Kazatom Pro. <laughs> <laughs> I own a very immodest amount. You take political risk there and you take some social risk too. There's been a lot of retirement in middle management in the company, which tells me yeah. that there's some turmoil at the top. Uh, I don't know what the turmoil is and people haven't told me. This is the largest and lowest cost uranium producer on the planet. Uh, this is also uh, a company I suggest that probably has the best undeveloped pipeline on the planet. This is a country in uh, a frontier market where uh, arrangements with regards to things like mining legislation, the rule of law uh, is still <laughs> being developed. So yeah. there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, I really like the caliber of the middle managers. Unfortunately, mon some, several of the ones that I've left that I that I liked have left, and yeah. I really like the reserves and resources. But this is not for the politically or socially faint of heart. Uh, do you believe that they will solve their uh, acid problems, sulfuric acid problems? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, when I see operational problems like this, if I see operational capabilities within the company, uh, I've learned over the last 45 years that these problems are transitory uh, and anticipating a solution. And this is a very solvable problem. Uh, anticipating a solution takes time. Most investors have a problem with time. 
uh, most investors don't understand the market response to the solution of a problem and the fact that if you anticipate a problem and its solution, that you can get doubles or triples uh, in the two or three year time frame. Most yeah. investors' yeah. time frames, unfortunately, are limited to between now and the next long weekend. Yes, yes. Because they don't have the courage of their convictions. They haven't studied the companies well enough. They are unwilling to take the time risk. Yeah, agreed. Uh, what about chemical? Uh, I'm a chemical shareholder. Uh, I'm scared to death uh, about their acquisition of Westinghouse. I understand why they did it. They want to be a full-scale uranium services company. They want to explore for the stuff, find the stuff, mine the stuff, process the stuff, and then turn it into watts by building nuclear power plants and operating them. My difficulty with that is that engineering uh, EPCM businesses uh, and technology businesses are very different than mining businesses. Yeah. And I don't know if they have the internal capability to run that business. If they do, if they do, this is a long ball home run. <clears throat> the idea that you ultimately don't sell uranium, but rather you sell electricity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, if I remember correctly, you were bullish on fission uranium. What's your take on them? And do you believe that they will produce in this decade? Uh, will they produce in this decade? Uh, no. Agreed. Uh, it, it will take uh, probably 10 years to permit, finance, and build that mine. But I'm bullish. Uh, that mine needs to be developed in concert with NextGen, which is the best undeveloped uranium deposit that I know of in the world. They are both very, very, very far from infrastructure. So the idea that you would build them separately is insane. Now, the industry has been insane on occasion, and I yeah. could be wrong. But I suspect that the district needs to be consolidated, and you consolidate by taking over fission. There is one better deposit, uh, and that is Willow River from Denison. I mean, when it comes to economics, the, it's a better deposit. Uh, what's your take on Denison Mines? Uh, that requires some technology. Uh, this in-place in situ recovery, deep in situ recovery scares me. Yes, it's very high grade. Very, very, very high grade. But it's technically technically much more challenging uh, than next gen. Um, okay. I own Denison. Uh, again, I don't talk about Denison much <clears throat> because it requires the answer to an unanswered question, and I don't know how to anticipate success. That is the real applicability of in situ recovery at depth, not in a sandstone hosted horizon. Uh, that, if it works, again, you got a real game changer, but I'm not smart enough to know <laughs> if it's going to work. <laughs> In my opinion, it will work, and uh, they already proved that they extracted a small amount of uranium uh, in their field tests. But of course, it, it's yeah. a different story when you produce it. And right. so I agree. Uh, what about Anchor Energy? I uh, don't know enough to comment. Okay. What about ISO Energy? Uh, I'm a holder, uh, great exploration team, great land position, nice initial discovery. Uh, of course, the stock has worked fairly well, <laughs> so uh, you need to take into account the fact that they've already been paid for some of that success. Yeah. What about ASA Energy? Don't know enough to comment. You are energy? I'm not a holder. Uh, high quality people. I've known them for a very long time. From my point of view, a collection of small mines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, two African, Niger, uh, Global Atomic. Uh, Global Atomic, I uh, I think in fairness, you need to see how their protocols with the Nigerian government work out. <clears throat> I believe that they're going to work out, but my belief is not the same as a fundamental. Yeah. Uh, I believe that Niger would like to free itself from what they see as the yoke of U.S. and French imperialism. And while they do that, there's going to be uh, some social and political turmoil in Niger. I think that the government of Niger sees the Russians uh, as guarantees of their own personal power. And whether or not that reliance on the Russians will cause things like title to deposits to change is an open question. <clears throat> yeah, uh, same question. I mean, different companies, same jurisdiction, that is GovX Uranium. Uh, same answer, although GovX is, is also active elsewhere in Africa. But make no mistake, these are both high quality deposits. And Niger is a wonderful place to look for and produce uranium from the point of view of geology. 
there are challenges there politically, there are challenges there socially, and there are challenges related to infrastructure that one must overcome. Uh, there's no challenges with regards to geology. You know, you're <laughs> yeah, you're in a spectacular place to look for and produce uranium. Uh, Rick, do you hold any uh, any juniors, uh, uranium juniors on lower scale uh, exploration companies? Uh, I'm a very large shareholder of Deep Yellow. Uh, in, in fairness, I've sold enough that uh, you know I have my bait back. Uh, I'm a holder of Boss. Uh, I'm a holder of uh, Lotus. Uh, I, I will admit that I'm uh, a holder of the 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 sort of Strathmore reincorporated uh, and F3. Uh, I, I would also tell your listeners that if you're going to own these stocks, you really have to bone up on the fundamentals of uranium exploration and development. Yeah, These are ones that you have to pay real attention to. They're both volatile and risky. Uh, volatile and risky means that there's real up upside if you're right, but it's not going to be a smooth ride. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. Uh, Rick, we mentioned a few great guys uh, here, uh, great CEOs. My question to you, can you name me, let's say, 10 new rising stars in the resource mining space, the new Landines, Friedlands, uh, mm -hmm. Lausanne's, etc.? I'd rather save that discussion for the next interview because I'm doing that right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, obviously, Amir Adnani comes to mind. Uh, if you look at what he's built, despite his fairly young age, uh, over the last 20 years, it's a very, very impressive performance. Um, Ivan Bebek uh, probably fits in that same crew. Um, I, I forget the guy's first name, but Stuart, the guy, the Orcorp uh, in Toronto, young guy. Who was, yeah, Stephen, behind a Wally uh, and some of those successes. Uh, I think he's, he's certainly worth uh, pointing to. Uh, but I really, uh, you know, if you're going to ask me for my top 10, I have to be more certain before I answer. So you're going to have to give me some time on that question. Okay, you gave me some. I'm satisfied with that. I uh, need to say, not this year, but next year, <clears throat> the Natural Resources Investment Symposium that we do a, a year from this July, uh, we are going to try to feature the upcoming living legends. For the last 30 years of my conference, we've had a panel called the Living Legends, which are people my age who have built multi-billion dollar mining companies from scratch. What we're looking for, not this year, but the year after that, is the next legends. Uh, we're looking at bringing together entrepreneurs in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, who we think precisely have the capabilities of being the next Robert Friedlands, the next Lucas Lundins. By the way, the next generation of legends will almost certainly include a Lundin or two, the grandchildren. De definitely. Uh, <laughs> definitely. Uh, I have two more questions, then I, I will let you go. Uh, you have, together with Harry Lundin, as you mentioned, Lundins uh, of Broma Capital, lead a consortium of uh, marquee mining investors with uh, 50 million, I think, investment into life zone metals that is connected with uh, with uh, uh, Govin Friedland, right? Yes. So what's your rationale for this investment? Uh, I've known the Kabanga nickel deposit for years. It was discovered by an old friend of mine, Roman Schlanka. I was actually on the deposit 25 years ago. Probably the best undeveloped sulfide nickel deposit in the world. The market hates nickel right now. Yes, definitely. And I love hate. Uh, so we didn't see any, co any competition financing this. We're senior secured. Uh, which means that we convert above market, giving some breathing room to retail shareholders, but we're secured at the asset level and we also get a 7.5% yield. Uh, I love investments like this. I love investments where I have some of my downside sheltered, but I provide catalytic capital to the upside that I get to participate in. And I particularly like providing catalytic capital when I have a management team uh, like the management team I have there, and when I have a tier one asset, and I think Kabanga has the potential to be a tier one asset. Yeah. Uh, final question, Rick, for you. Uh, is there any other commodities that you that are on your radar at the moment that you don't have any investments, but you are looking at them? Yeah, platinum and palladium, probably two years early. The Russians are dishoarding because the Russians need money. <laughs> Lots of political disruption in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Russia, which is where platinum and palladium are produced. 
So I'd love to find a good platinum or palladium company outside of those areas. I'd love to be allowed to invest in Russia again, but that's a different question. I'm attracted to nickel too, precisely because everybody hates it. Um, the lateritic nickel in Indonesia has blown everybody else out of the market. I think the growth in lateritic production ends two years from now. And I think Russian dishoarding of nickel uh, ends at some point in time in the next couple of years, if not because of the end of the war, then because the Russians run out of inventory to sell. I'm newly attracted to lithium. Uh, the fact that the lithium price has fallen so much, the fact that we found so much lithium means that there's going to be a huge shakeout in the lithium business. Shakeouts are really good for the industry and investors hate them. My belief is that in 2026, lithium will be regarded by the investment community as a four-letter word, a pejorative four-letter word. And I love hate. <laughs> Great to hear that. Uh, okay, let's remind uh, let's remind our viewers. You have uh, two upcoming events. Uh, first one is in April, your virtual bootcamp prospect generators, and you have another one in July, rule symposium on natural resource investing. Uh, I will leave the I will leave the, the link on both uh, in the comment section or in the interview. So, what can you tell me about those two? Well, first of all, if you care about exploration, if you're a real speculator, and I do, uh, if you're looking for 10 baggers or 20 baggers, uh, exploration is the place to be. And statistically, the most successful way to speculate in, in exploration is prospect generation, understanding that exploration is a technology business, not an asset-based business. We're going to do a deep dive into prospect generation, and I mean a deep dive. Don't come to this webinar if you're looking for entertainment. Come to this webinar if you actually want to work and become a better investor. You will have access to the tapes for a year and you'll need them. We're going to give you more information in eight hours than you can possibly, possibly absorb. Uh, importantly, uh, you don't have to come anywhere for this. You can see it in the comfort of your own home. Importantly, too, if you don't think that you got your money's worth from this, I will refund your money. The financial risk is all mine. Click on the link, learn about the seminar. I absolutely positively guarantee it'll be worth your while because if it isn't, all you have to do is email me and ask for your money back. You will get it back. Note, this is for hardworking speculators only. If you're a tourist, <laughs> if your investment strategy is got a hunch, bet a bunch, this is not the right place for you. We're going to work you really hard for eight hours. We would expect you to replay the tapes at least two or three times over the course of a year. So you're going to invest 30 hours in this. But your payback, uh, if you're a speculator, could be truly spectacular. Okay. The granddaddy uh, of all my events is, of course, the Natural Resources Investment Symposium. This right. takes place this year, July 7th through 11th in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, very popular with our European clients because flying to Florida is a one-hop trip. <laughs> they can get there nonstop. World-class resort, but more importantly, a, a world-class conference. I would suggest the best natural resources investment conference on the planet. First of all, it stood the test of time. It's been in existence for 30 years. <laughs> you don't do that by disappointing uh, customers. We have great big picture thinkers. The Jim Rickards of the world, the Daniela DiMartino Booths of the world, the Grant Williams of the world, the Nomi Princes of the world, the Bill Bonners of the world. People who tell you about the way the world is not the way that the World Economic Forum wishes it was. If you Great agree point. with this worldview, we have wonderful natural resource analysts and portfolio managers, people who have stood the test of time, not people in the bowels of an investment bank who failed as technology analysts and automobile analysts and were parachuted into resources, but rather high quality people who have made money in resources. Importantly, we have the living legends. Uh, people who've built multi-billion dollar companies from scratch. And we ask them to describe what they're doing today and why. We ask them to tell us the lessons that they've learned building these multi-billion dollars companies and how those lessons have made them better investors and speculators. Also, importantly, every exhibitor at our conference has been vetted by us. We have to own the companies that exhibit there. Now, that doesn't mean, sadly, Lucian, that if I own a company, the stock goes up. What it does mean is that like, unlike any other conference in the world, every single investor, uh, invest, uh, exhibitor has been vetted. We own them, which means we know enough about them to risk our own money on them. Uh, this is uh, important. Uh, 
Yeah. And once once again, whether you come to Boca Raton physically, which would be my preference, or if you watch the live stream at home, you'll have access to the recordings for a year and you'll need it. Again, we're going to give you more information in four days than you can absorb in four days. So it's incumbent on you to be willing to do the homework, to replay the tapes uh, afterwards. Once again, too, regardless of whether you attend in person or via live stream, your tuition, if you don't think that the uh, content uh, was useful to you, your tuition is fully refundable. Uh, I would love it if you asked for a rebound, if you told me how I could serve you better in the future, but that's no requirement. Just say, I didn't get my money's worth. I want my money back. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, Rick, do you still uh, rank portfolios? Absolutely, positively. Uh, any of your listeners who liked what I had to say about resources can make it personal. Go to my website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com, list your natural resource stocks. I personally will rank them one to 10. I'll comment on individual issues like we did in the rapid fire session today if I think that my comments might have value. Once again, ruleinvestmentmedia.com, list your natural resource stocks. I'll rank them. That was Mr. Rick Roll. Rick, thank you once again for coming to my show. I wish you luck with your all your investments and let's catch up sometime soon again. I look forward to it, Lucien. Thank you very much for this conversation and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to address your audience.